Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to All the Gear and No Idea. Well, as per usual, I've got absolutely no idea what I'm talking about today, so I guess that's never stopped me before, so let's crack on. Well, you can see on the bench here, I've got what is a Hacker Hunter radio. Now, this radio was very kindly donated to the channel by Sean of the Man Cave Workshop. Now, when it comes to Hacker Radio, Sean really is quite an expert on them, and uh, he does some amazing work restoring them. But for me, I've got to admit, this is the first time that I've ever actually had a Hacker Radio. And I've got to admit to having some quite big gaps in my knowledge, because uh, I've never really owned small transistor radios like this. Not only have I never owned them, I've never really worked on them. I can't really explain why. I guess at an early age my uh, my grandfather was into radio ham gear so I was always into uh, kind of shortwave listening on war surplus old communication receivers and stuff like that. So I've never actually kind of played with small battery portables like this and uh, they're not something that I'm very familiar with. Now for today I don't intend to talk about this radio very much because I don't want to spoil it for a future episode where we're really going to tear into it and uh, I'm going to have a go at restoring one of these for the first time. But because I don't know anything about these transistor radios I've been doing some reading and uh, a piece of equipment keeps coming up again and again when you read the service manual. And what that piece of equipment is is something called an AM radio alignment loop and uh, that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. Now if we take a look inside the radio you can see that we've got these uh, we've got these cans here which are variable inductors so they can be adjusted and I can also see some uh, trimmer capacitors we've got one there there and there. Now a radio when it was originally manufactured in the factory all these adjustment points they would have been uh, set up at time of manufacture but after maybe 40 or 50 years it's not unusual the component values will have drifted and it could mean that your radio isn't performing as well as it should be not as well as it was uh, as it did when it came out of the workshop so it's quite common to have to take a, a small screwdriver now I'm not going to adjust it but you can put a screwdriver into some of these things and you can turn them and we can adjust there's a ferrite core inside here and we adjust them to get the peak performance out of the radio now when we do a radio alignment we need a signal to actually uh, align the radio too so it's quite common to actually connect a signal generator to a radio like this in the case of this hunter hacker that's fairly easier to do because it's got what they call a motorola connector here now I'm sure most of you will be familiar with these Motorola connectors even if you don't know the name. So the old fashioned car radios they used to have a kind of a long male plug and uh, it would be quite a long connector and you basically you would push it in the kind of thing you had on car stereos back in the day. So that's a Motorola connector. So if I want to uh, connect a signal generator to this radio for the purpose of aligning it that's fairly easy to do because I just plug in to the external socket and I can actually feed some RF into it. Now for a lot of AM radios it won't be possible to do that because it won't have an external antenna connection like this one does. If we look inside this radio it's tucked down here so you probably can't see it. There's actually a ferrite rod so this radio will work even if we don't have the external aerial connected. Well a lot of radios don't even have this external connector. Uh, they just have either a ferrite rod or they have an internal frame antenna which is just a number of turns of wire so quite often you'll kind of see them loop around the inside of the case or maybe looped around the back cover and uh, that's a frame aerial if you see one of them. Now it can actually be quite difficult to connect a signal generator to a radio that doesn't have one of these external antenna connectors. Now there is ways of doing it. You can do things like if it's a valve radio you can maybe put a, a loop of wire around um, the oscillator mixer valve. In the case of a transistor radio you can maybe put a loop of wire around the ferrite rod and you can connect your signal generator to that loop of wire and uh, you can feed your signal in. But if you, whenever you connect your signal generator to a radio one of the risks that you run is you can do what they call detune it. So it will actually work 
perfectly well when your signal generator is connected to it but the actual loading effect of the signal generator can alter the tuning so you could do your alignment and then take the signal generator away and you'll find that the radio doesn't work very well the uh, it's not adjusted correctly and that's because the actual connection of your signal generator affected the alignment process so for that reason if you actually read various service manuals for these old transistor radios and not just transistor radios, valve radios as well they call up a piece of equipment called an alignment loop so I'll show you a picture of an alignment loop here and this is what they typically describe in the uh, service manuals. So I got the idea for building our alignment loop antenna after reading the Hacker Democrat service manual and uh, the model number was RP34 for those of you who want to follow along at home. Now unfortunately there was only a written description of the loop antenna and there wasn't actually a drawing so you can see that here's a drawing that I've produced. So what we need to build this particular loop is a piece of either brass or copper tubing and that needs to be about quarter of an inch in diameter and we take that copper or brass tubing and we need to roll it into a C shape and the diameter needs to be about 10 inches. Now it's very important when you roll this C shape of copper or brass that the two ends don't actually touch each other. It must be a C shape, it mustn't be a complete circle with the two ends touching because uh, it won't work properly if you do it like that. Now the next thing you need to do is to take some 20 gauge wire. Now 20 gauge wire is about 0.8 millimetres in diameter and you need to take the length of wire and you need to feed it three times into the tube because you're trying to form a coil with three turns on it and you need to connect that to the earth to the ground connection of a BNC connector. Now at the same time you need to take one side of the brass or copper loop and you need to connect that to the earthy side of the BNC connector as well. And again it's very important that you don't connect both sides of the loop to the BNC connector because if you were to connect both sides you'd effectively be shorting the loop out and uh, it wouldn't work properly. Now for the final part of the build all you have to do is you've got to take the other end of the coil and you've got to connect that to the centre of the BNC. Now you want to connect it via a 405 ohm resistor. Now of course I didn't have a, a 405 ohm resistor being a non-preferred value so what I did is I took a 390 ohm and a 15 ohm resistor and uh, I used them instead. So the description that I have just given you is what they call a standard loop antenna and you'll find that widely described of how to build it in lots of various radio service manuals and literature. But when I was thinking of constructing this loop it presented me with a couple of problems one is I don't have any suitable brass or copper tubing and uh, one thing is when I make something I want to make it nice so I think it would be quite difficult to actually bend that copper or brass tubing into a really nice C shape I mean you could try and bend it over your knee or something like that it's easy to form a 90 degree bend in copper or brass tubing just using standard uh, you know, pipe bending tools but to form a circle or a C shape I think that would be uh, difficult you could, you could certainly do it but I think it would end up looking a little bit lumpy now as it happens to actually do this job properly I've actually ordered something called a ring roller so we are going to have a go at making one of these using the exact uh, correct technique and using the right materials but I was thinking I really want to build one of these loop antennas today and I want to build something that everybody else can build with me and have a go at building at home so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace our brass loop I'm actually going to screen our coil, our windings. I'm going to screen it using just aluminium kitchen foil. So I'm going to show you how to build a, a loop using aluminium kitchen foil rather than using a, a brass or copper tube and hopefully it will still work just fine. Well let's get started. So you're going to need some uh, materials, none of which are exceptionally critical. So here's just a, a coil of wire. Um, ideally to use 20 gauge wire that would be about 0.8 millimetres. I think this is about 0.7 millimetres so it's a little bit under that but it'll still work just the same so you need some wire and it wants to be insulated wire and this is single core. You're going to need some sticky tape, any type of sticky tape will do. I found that this caps on tape was easier to use, not because it's actually caps on tape but because it's quite narrow but of course you could just use some masking tape and uh, maybe split it down the middle because uh, it's easier to wrap round if it's a little bit thinner. You're going to need some aluminium kitchen foil so go and steal that from the kitchen when there's nobody looking. 
Uh, you're going to need some scissors to cut the foil, perhaps a ruler, some wire cutters. Now the other thing that you probably are going to need is you need something to actually form the loop. You need a former. So this is about 10 inches across. It kind of it's a bit narrow at the bottom. It actually measures about nine and a half inches at this side, but it actually tapers. So about halfway along it, just over halfway, it goes out to about 10 inches. So this is a this is a bird feeder container, but again maybe you can steal a I don't know a, a large pan from the kitchen and uh, wrap it around that you could even just get a, a piece of wood and you could uh, you could bang some tacks in it to form a circle and then wrap the wire around that or maybe you could even just cut out um, some circles from pieces of cardboard or a piece of wood again absolutely non-critical if your loop is uh, I don't know nine inches or eleven inches instead of ten the real world it's going to make very very little difference so just find something that's about ten inches and uh, let me show you what you do. One, two, three. So I just put three turns of wire around here. Leave the ends a little bit long because uh, you are going to have to adjust these. And uh, take a cable tie. You're just going to use a cable tie to hold everything together temporarily. Now this is really a job where if you can get somebody just to help you, um, it would help a lot because you kind of need four hands. So what you want to do is you want to just make sure that the uh, the loops of wire that you put around here, the free windings, you want to make sure that everything is snugged down and tight. And uh, the cable tie will help you do that. Now of course if we were actually building this into either a brass or a copper tube we wouldn't be able to make it in the same way. What you'd have to do is you'd have to thread the wire through the tube. It does help that this is a little bit of a, a taper shape because it means once you've actually formed the coil I can actually just push it down a little bit further and uh, it just tightens everything up nicely. Now it might actually be quite a nice thing to do is to put a bit of hot melt glue or something on there just to secure those. So the next thing that we're going to need is some uh, sticky tape. Now I'm using caps on but it doesn't have to be. You could use uh, masking tape or cellar tape. Again, whatever comes to hand. And this is a, an ideal opportunity maybe to enslave a young person in the family because uh, cutting these little pieces of tape into little short strips, it's a, it's a fiddler. And tedious job but that's what you need to do you need to uh, maybe cut yourself uh, probably at least 10 uh, strips of tape so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to lift our loop up I think I'm going to secure it here first ideally you only want to go around it a couple of turns that went around about five times so you want to cut these uh, pieces of tape really quite short. So again, I'm putting it back on the former. Make sure it's tightened up nicely. Now I think we'll we'll go around to the other side. We'll put one on the back side here. It doesn't have to be super neat. This all we're doing is we're just bunching the wire together, and it'll come to a point where you can actually uh, just take this off, which I will do now. And all you do is uh, you just keep going round the uh, the loop, kind of working. I'm going to say cross corners but you know what I mean you just want to keep subdividing the loop until you've got a good covering of uh, tape over it right okay well you can go ahead and you can keep putting a tape around this loop you can put as much around it as you want to uh, I put about four or five pieces on there um, the more you put on it the better the loop will be formed and uh, the neater it will look but I'm going to call that done for now. So the next thing that you want to do is, uh, as I say, you want to go and go down to the kitchen and uh, when nobody's looking you want to steal a piece of aluminium foil. And uh, you're going to take the aluminium foil and uh, straighten it out a little bit first maybe. Let's see if we can do that. I'm going to take the foil and we're going to cut this into, uh, we're going to cut it into strips. Now, if you make the strips too wide when you try and wrap it around the uh, the loop that we've created, you'll find that it won't lay down very flat. So I have found that you want to make it, um, I don't know, maybe less than a couple of centimetres, a centimetre and a half, maybe just under half an inch. But you want to cut strips like this. Um, 
you could of course use a longer piece of foil and then you would uh, you would need less strips but um, you know this is just a piece that I managed to steal without anybody noticing so that's what I got we're not doing any measuring at all we're just we're just guessing and then at one side of your loop you want to take your foil and uh, just want to start to wind it around now it's better if you take a little bit of care doing this uh, you want to try to wrap it relatively tightly um, so it you know it isn't going to just come undone. The aluminium tape, um, sorry not the aluminium, the aluminium foil, it will kind of stay bent in the position you put it to a fashion. You've got to get just the right amount of pressure. If you try and pull the tape too tightly or overwork it, you'll snap it, and uh, you know you'll have to have another go. Now the next part is important. When you actually wind on the next piece of foil, you don't want to just start here. You've got to overlap it. And I've been overlapping it again, probably just over an inch. Now the reason that I'm overlapping it is because we want the, uh, the second piece of foil that we had. We want it to be in really good contact with the first piece of foil. They need to be electrically um, conducting with each other. So you just need to lay one on top of the other and uh, they will work themselves out fine. Again, I'm sure you could uh, enlist a helper to uh, cut these strips of foil because um, it is kind of tedious just having to stop what you're doing. You get into the flow of uh, wrapping this foil around and uh, if you've got to stop and cut another piece as I'm doing, uh, yeah, it kind of just ruins the flow. And there's a couple more strips cut. And you can see that, again, I haven't been very neat with this. Again, it doesn't matter. So start again, you want to uh, overlay the last piece of foil by about an inch. Oops, and I've ripped it there, we won't worry, have another go. So I'm going to call that about done, so I'll just finish off by wrapping the last piece of foil quite tightly at the end. So you can see we've got a loop antenna. Now from time to time it does just help to uh, put it back onto the former because it does start to kind of go out of shape as you handle it. So just put it back onto its former and stretch it back into a nice circle. It will still work if it isn't a circle, it's just that we want to keep it nice and uh, aesthetically pleasing. So there we go, a nice circle again. So this foil that we've actually put round here, it's actually quite conductive because it is made out of aluminium. But I'm going to copy a, a trick that you quite often find in, a, in cables which are screened with a foil. They actually take a, a drain wire as well because you do find that because I've made this uh, all this, this foil ring, I've made it out of separate strips, you do get a bit of resistance between each of those strips where they join each other. So what I've done is I've just taken a piece of single core wire. So all this wire is, it's a piece of this PC, PVC insulated wire. And I've just stripped off the outer coating. And uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to wrap that round here like this. We're going to wrap that round our ring. That will just put it back onto its former. And uh, we're going to put another layer of aluminium tape on it. Now, just to secure everything for now, I'm just going to tape our uh, our piece of wire. I'm just going to tape it on just to stop it flopping around too much. Now, I've got to admit, I'm not really sure if this uh, if this wire is critical or not. Um, this is what I've done, and uh, it seems to work okay to me. I've made a couple of these and uh, I've tried experimented, experimenting with them, with the foil, without the foil, um, with the drain wire, without the drain wire. To be perfectly honest, I can, uh, I can detect very, very little difference in the performance. Uh, in fact, pretty much no difference in the performance. But it, to me, it just seems like it's a good idea to make the resistance of the, uh, of the screen in loop as low as possible. And uh, I think the drain wire does help just reduce that resistance a little bit more. So I'm going to pull that back onto the former, tighten it up, get it back into its nice circular shape. Now 
Now I'm afraid it's back to that tedious job of uh, winding a bit more foil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wind uh, another two layers of foil on top of here. Just a note on this uh, single core wire that I've put it put through it. It's very important that you don't actually allow one side of the foil to meet the other side. So what I am going to do is again I'm just going to finish that here. So I'm just going to put some wraps of wire around there. Can I wrap it back on itself? I think I probably can. So that should stay secure. So we're going to take another layer of aluminium foil and uh, I'm going to put another layer of aluminium foil on top of here now. So it's back to, uh, I'm afraid, cutting some strips again. Oops, accidentally ripped the foil there. If you do, no worries. Just go back an inch and start wrapping it around again. I'm trying to do this quite quickly just for the point of uh, expediency but if you uh, if you take your time over this you can, I'm sure you can do a much neater job than I've done here but it can be messy I don't think it's going to affect the uh, the performance at all I have done a little bit of testing with uh, various ones I built a couple of prototypes first and uh, as I say I really couldn't find any difference in them Now I don't think I've actually explained the principle of operation for this uh, this particular antenna really, but this uh, you know you'll be aware that there's two types of electromagnetic field. We've got the uh, the E field, we've got the electric field, and we've got the magnetic field. Now this antenna is uh, what they call a magnetic loop antenna. So rather than giving off an electrical field, it's actually designed to give off a magnetic field. And that's what things like your ferrite rod antennas inside your radios are sensitive to. They're much more sensitive to magnetic fields than they are to the electrical field. So I think what we're actually trying to do here by screening the loop, we're actually trying to make this antenna not give off an E field, we're actually trying to make it work just in the magnetic field region. So that, that's my understanding of probably why we're doing it. Now loop antennas can be quite useful uh, as receiving antennas because um, you tend to get a lot of localised noise in the environment. You know if you've got an antenna up at your house um, equipment in your house gives off an awful lot of uh, electrical interference. Now you tend to find for whatever reason that a lot of that interference will be electrical interference. So if you can build um, an antenna which is not sensitive to electrical interference, it's not sensitive to electrical fields, but it is sensitive to magnetic fields, it will often um, be a lot quieter in operation. Now unfortunately they're not commonly used um, because they tend to have very very narrow bandwidths um, in operation so they're not necessarily the most practical thing to actually um, to have set up in the home environment so you'll find people like um, radio amateurs they will experiment with magnetic loops but I'm afraid they tend to have very very narrow bandwidths and require a bit of tuning and fettling so that's why you don't see magnetic loop antennas um, you know kind of in very common use so what I would suggest you do is uh, you want to uh, first of all put a, a, a coil of this aluminium tape on first then you want to put this uh, drain wire on this single core stripped wire you want to put that on and then on top of that I would put another two layers of uh, copper foil. Okay well I've gone ahead and I've added another layer of foil to our loop screening and all I'm doing now is I'm, I'm going to take some uh, again some caps on tape and uh, you probably could skip this step again if you want to and uh, I'm just going to wind some tape around the aluminium foil once you've squished the aluminium foil down get it as tight as you can just because it's quite delicate the foil you could get it snagged or ripped what you want to do is you want to uh, just go around it with uh, with tape any old tape use black insulation tape if you want again extremely non-critical and uh, what you'll find is that will just help to uh, just hold everything together and make it a little bit more mechanical, mechanically robust. So I'm going to carry on doing that off camera. 
Now, once you've actually uh, finished making your loop like that, there's a couple of different things you could do with it. If you just want to use it, you could basically just drop it onto the desk like that, or maybe even, uh, as I say, glue it underneath your desk and uh, connect some connectors to it and the resistors, and uh, off you would go. But I want to uh, build some kind of support because it is a little bit wibbly wobbly like this, and it could quite easily get damaged. Now, the first idea I had was simply just to get a piece of uh, cardboard and, uh, you know, make just cut a piece of cardboard out and uh, either glue it or uh, cable tie it to a piece of uh, cardboard, fixed stiff cardboard. I actually think it probably worked quite well if you hot melt glued it to a piece of cardboard. And you could maybe uh, make that piece of cardboard like an L shape or maybe kind of like a triangle because you want to stand the loop antenna up like that. But I think what I'm going to choose to do is I want to make it look nice. So I think, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go out into the garage and do some of that dratted woodwork. So having gone ahead and made our loop antenna, I think the next thing to do is just to make some kind of support for it. Now I'm going to make it out of a piece of wood and the main reason I'm going to make it out of this piece of wood in the way I'm going to make it is because I happen to just have this one piece of wood. So uh, yeah, it's basically this or bust. But there's hundreds of different ways that you could actually make a support for this loop antenna. And in fact, perhaps you wouldn't even need to make a, a support for it at all. I mean, if you bend it slightly, it really isn't going to alter the performance very much. But um, yeah, you don't want to kind of squash it completely out of shape. So of course you could just maybe just uh, glue it or cable tie it to a piece of cardboard for support. And that would work absolutely fine. I also know that uh, Simon Spears, he's got a loop antenna and he's actually got it glued to the underside of his bench. So that's something you could do as well. You could just glue it to the underside of your bench and then it's out the way, isn't it? So that seems like a quite a neat and novel solution. But I'm going to use this piece of wood. So I think the way I'm going to do it, or I'm going to try to do it, and it could all go horribly wrong because I've got my router here. And I've got to admit, I haven't used this router in... 10 years and I think I only used it once before that. I, uh, I'm not really very good with routers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to uh, route a groove into this piece of MDF material and then I'm going to drop our loop antenna inside it like that and hopefully um, you know it'll stay there. We might have to put some glue in or something like that but that's the plan. We're going to glue it inside and then again using the router I'm going to cut this circle shape out and uh, Hopefully it's going to be a little bit reminiscent of one of those uh, round echoes that we all want to pay so much money for. So that's the look that I'm going for. Whether it'll turn out like that, who can tell? But let's get cracking. Yeah, I think that will uh, go in, but I'm just thinking maybe just a little bit deeper so I can get some adhesive in there. We're less than halfway through. Yeah, I think we'll risk going a little bit deeper. This is where it'll probably go horribly wrong.
Well I've got to admit this MDF doesn't seem as uh, hard or dense as I remember it being back in the day. It's actually very uh, fibrous so we'll have to give it some coats of uh, shellac and stuff like that to seal it. But I think you can see what I was trying to do. That's pretty much what I wanted. So uh, I'm just going to have to spend some time rubbing it down now and we'll see how we do with that. Well I've got to admit after what is quite a massive and tedious amount of sanding you do end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So uh, let's go ahead and just try and fit our loop inside it. So that looks as though that will be okay to me. We'll glue that inside there. Now you can also see that I've, I've recessed it out there, just routed it out and uh, that's to give some clearance because we're going to put um, a BNC connector sticking out the front there. Now of course another problem with uh, MDF, apart from it being kind of a little bit weak, it, uh, it just constantly dusts. So it's important that you put something to seal it on. Ideally you would uh, put some sanding sealer on it and then probably put a few coats of uh, varnish on to uh, actually just seal the MDF. But of course I'm far too uh, impatient and lazy to do that. So what I'm going to use instead is just some French polish and the main reason I'm using it is because it dries quickly and that's what I have. OK, well I've put some gloves on because this stuff will stain your hands a little bit and it's a mess if it gets on them. So there's absolutely no elegance involved with this. You just basically put it on and uh, leave it to dry. And uh, you should be able to get a coat on about every uh, about every 20 minutes or half an hour. And I'd probably recommend you put something like uh, three coats on. You can sand between each coat if you want to just improve the finish. I probably won't bother again just because I'm quite lazy and you'll find that it does actually soak in very easily. So shellac is actually quite a good product for sealing uh, MDF. 
So what I think I'll do is I'm going to carry on painting this and I'll bring you back when we finish. Well it's the morning after the day before and as you can see I've gone ahead and, and uh, I did give this a coat of the shellac and uh, I've just fitted the antenna loosely. I'm wondering whether or not I'll glue this in or just uh, push it inside like that because it does seem to want to stay. I think I might just put a little bit of glue on there but not too much because you never ever want to take it out or change it. So what I've got to do next is we've got to make some kind of feet for this because it has to stand up vertically and the other thing we've got to make is we've got to make a plate that's going to go on here with a BNC connector on it so that we can uh, plug the test leads into. So uh, that's what I'm going to do next and I think for my feet design I think I'm going to try to do something that maybe uh, kind of follows a similar principle some curves down here maybe forward and backwards I don't sure well uh, let's crack on with that see how we get on
Well, as you can see, I'm about ready just to do my final assembly. And what I've decided to do is I'm actually going to glue these feet on. And the reason I'm going to glue them on is because, uh, in my experience, if you try and put screws through here, I was going to drill a hole and put a screw through the bottom into here. But in my experience, if you do that, what tends to happen is the, uh, the MDF is really quite weak. And as soon as you start drilling it and tying it up, this thing will probably just break out and snap. So to avoid that, I'm going to glue it. It's not like this thing needs a lot of uh, material strength. It really, the feet kind of will hold themselves on. They just need a, you know, just a little bit of additional support. So I'm going to use some uh, nameless uh, two-part epoxy here, and hopefully I can do this without getting it absolutely everywhere. But um, don't know, maybe not. Uh, now the other reason that I'm using epoxy rather than using wood glue or something is a. Uh, just basically because uh, I'm quite lazy and I can't be bothered to wait for uh, uh, PVA glue, wood glue, to dry. Whereas if I use two-part epoxy like this, it's going to be uh, dry enough to handle within uh, 10 or 15 minutes maybe, maybe 20 at the most. So it means we can get on and uh, start doing other things. Now the other thing you saw me doing earlier, you saw me uh, polishing up that um, brass plate that takes the BNC connector. Now I'd polished that up and I was originally going to put some uh, clear coat lacquer on it. That was certainly my idea. Um, but I've not, uh, I've not done that in the end. And the simple reason that I haven't done it is uh, I couldn't find any clear coat. But that was certainly the plan. But seeing as I haven't got any clear coat, well, I'm just going to put it together as it is. At the end of the day, this is a, a tool. I'd like it to be pretty, but it's not a work of art. It's just a tool. So as long as it, um, you know, as long as it works, that's, that's the main thing that I'm certainly interested in. What I think we'll do is we'll uh, we'll put the first first of the feet on, then we will uh, we'll leave it 20 minutes and then well I'll probably leave it 10 minutes actually. I think this stuff will set really quickly. Let's just get this uh, assembled now. I'm just giving it a wiggle. I don't mind if a little bit of glue spills out. Again, at the end of the day, this is uh, it's just got to uh, to work as a loop antenna. It doesn't have to be perfectly aesthetic. If there is too much glue splodging out, I will try and uh, wipe it off, but I don't mind that much. Well, it's maybe not perfectly straight, but I think it's straight enough now. I probably need to put some weight on that while that sets. What can we find to put a bit of weight on? Well, as you can see, we're back in the electronics workshop, and uh, for me, this is the bit that I probably enjoy most, which is the final assembler. So you can see that I went ahead and I glued together the uh, loop antenna onto its base and I've also uh, gone ahead and I've just given it another quick coat of uh, shellac. So I'm thinking that that looks uh, really quite presentable now. I'm really quite happy with that. So what we've got to do now is uh, we've actually just got to connect up our loop antenna to this uh, brass plate that's got our BNC connector on it. So we've got to connect that up and uh, finally just install the loop inside the uh, the support the wooden support like that and uh, screw the pl brass plate on and we're about finished now I'm not sure if I just shared with you the details of these uh, connections to the uh, to the BNC so I'll just go through that with you if I haven't shown it previously these two green wires are the actual loop the three turns of wire that we've got now at one end one end of that loop what I've done is I've taken the green wire here and I've actually soldered it to the screen connection that goes around the loop antenna so one side of the loop is connected to the screen and then I've extended the wire because this is going to go on to the uh, the shielded side of the BNC connector now the other end of our loop antenna here this needs to connect to the center of our BNC because that's where we're going to feed the signal into but we don't just connect the green wire directly to the center of the BNC we've got to connect it via a resistor and according to the instructions they do specify a 405 ohm 1% resistor so for whatever reason the designers have actually classed us as being uh, quite critical now having a look through the uh, the box of resistors it's not unsurprising that I haven't got a 405 ohm resistor so what I've done is I've taken a 390 ohm and a 315 ohm because they're the nearest preferred values that I've got and you can see I've just soldered them together so that's what we're going to do so we've got to cut this uh, green wire a little bit shorter and then we're going to install this uh, this set of resistors between 
this green wire here and the centre of our BNC. So you can just watch me do that. Now regarding the grounding end of the loop, I think I'll just go ahead and I'm just going to put some uh, heat shrink on there just to stop it shorting out internally. And uh, then we're going to have to solder that onto there. In fact, let's just do that first because it's a nice easy job. Well, unfortunately, I think that might have just about been off camera, but I've, again, I've soldered the uh, two resistors onto one end of the loop. And uh, just the same, I'm just going to put some uh, heat shrink over it to help stop it shorting out. So this is going to go to uh, to about here somewhere. Now I guess before I assemble the loop let's just check that we have got continuity. So between the uh, the centre conductor of the BNC and the loop back to the ground return we should see about 405 ohms so let's just see if we've got that. And we have bang on 405 ohms so that's good enough. Okay so the last thing to do now is just the uh, is actually just assemble it into the uh, the frame so let me do that. Okay, there's something just fighting me a little bit. I'm wondering if the uh, the back of the BNC is just a little bit too deep. So I couldn't quite fit it in. I think what it is is it's the back of this BNC connector which is just sticking out, and what with the uh, bend radius of the wire, I just couldn't close the box up. So I've just cut the back of the BNC down, and I'm just going to uh, solder our wire onto there. Yep, that does seem to have done the trick. Now just a little bit of a tip, when you're actually tightening up brass screws it's very important that you actually have a screwdriver that fits. If you have one that's too big or too small it will just uh, destroy the head. Well I'm not sure what you guys think, I actually think that looks really quite smart doesn't it? The question is though, will it work? Let's find out. Well as you can see we've gone ahead and we've put our hacker radio back on the bench so here's the uh, loop antenna and uh, what you want to do is you want to actually arrange it at 90 degrees now the, fer the ferrite rod is running in this direction in this particular radio so by 90 degrees I mean not like that 90 degrees for this case would be like that so the loop antenna the, uh, the circular loop windings here they're at 90 degrees to our ferrite rod antenna. Uh, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my signal generator and I'm just going to plug it in. So we've set the uh, the radio here to uh, 350 meters. We're at, um, what's that, about quarter volume. Now 350 meters, for any of you not still living in 1950, that's approximately 856 kilohertz. So hopefully if we actually plug our loop antenna now into the signal generator, we should hear our pilot tone. So let's just put that on. Speaking to Owen. So I'm hoping that you can hear that on camera. So that high-pitched whining you can hear, that's the, uh, that's the output from the signal generator, which is set to 856 kilohertz. Now we've got uh, a 1 kilohertz modulated tone setup and 30% modulation depth. So that's what we're using to, uh, to feed this loop antenna. And as you can hear, the, uh, the radio is picking that up. And just to prove that there is uh, no shenanigans, let me just pick this up and we'll move it. and then we'll bring it back and I'm hoping you'll also be able to hear if we did have the uh, the antenna in the wrong polarization let me just move it in line I'm hoping you can hear that that's not as loud so let me just turn it around 
So typically when we're using these loop antennas for radio alignment, they're actually usually used to do the front end of the radio. Um, so that's like the main tuning items, which are, I don't know, I'm going to say they're installed between the antenna and uh, maybe the, uh, the mixer stage. So to talk technically, they're not generally used to do all the wibbly wobbly IF alignment. But although they're not designed to do that, you can actually usually uh, couple enough um, of the intermediate frequency into the radio to actually do an IF alignment as well. So this particular radio is, uh, I think the IF for it is around uh, 470 kilohertz. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to change the frequency on the signal generator to 470 kilohertz, and you're going to still be able to hear the tone. So I've just gone ahead and I've reset the signal generator to 470 kilohertz now. And uh, we should be able to tell that we're actually coupling with the IF stage. We've missed out all the tuning stage completely now because I've actually changed the tuning on the radio. You can see that whatever I tune the radio to, you can still you can still hear the tone. So this loop is injecting a signal straight into the IF. So not only can we use a loop antenna to actually tune the front end of a radio, in most, but not all cases, in most cases we can also use it to do the IF alignment as well. Well, I'm purposely not going to talk too much about radio alignment today because I think this video has been quite long enough, but I just wanted to give you a quick demonstration. And maybe when we see this radio again, we're going to be doing a lot more testing on it. We're going to be using this loop antenna and uh, hopefully we're going to be doing a full alignment on it. But that's for next time. So I think for today, that'll do. Thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you all very soon. But bye bye for now.